Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk at this interesting workshop. Uh, my name is Hossein Mobahi, and this is joint work with uh, Google AI resident Calvin Luo. Today, I'll be talking about using differential operators for generating structured adversarial examples. You see a couple of keywords here. Um, so I'll uh, basically go over each of those, uh, providing some background material, so hopefully it will be accessible to a wide range of audience that are in this workshop. The first thing I need to define is a very uh, simple concept in uh, image classification mainly. Uh, people use it in other domains, but dominantly used in image classification. And it's called data augmentation. So before even telling you what it is, I should say that it is a very crucial uh, uh, ingredient for achieving state-of-the-art models for image classification tasks. And the way it works is the following. It just takes a training set, a set of images that you have and inflates that image by a bigger set to a bigger set. And the way it does that is by taking the original images, applying some transformation to those images to create new valid images of those objects. For example, it can take an image of a cat, shift it a little bit or rotate it a little bit, and then we know that it still must be a cat, right? So it just creates a new image for, for, for the uh, animal cat, and you can use the original image plus these you know, transformed versions. And of course, to us as humans, it looks very obvious. This is just a shifted version or rotated version of the original image, but it's actually very informative and very helpful for, um, for machine to use this uh, kind of data to pick up that knowledge because it doesn't have these invariances um, uh, beforehand and it has to learn it from the data. So as I said, it's very important ingredient for training models, but there is also a downside to it. And it is that we need to sample from these transformations. Um, and this sampling can become inefficient and expensive if our transformation space is rich. What does that mean? So if we start from like very simple transformation, again, right, translation, we only have two parameters, uh, changes in X, uh, moving X, and moving Y directions, right? So I can easily sample this space, let's say, by shifting plus minus 10 pixels in each direction. That's, that's not a big deal. But then I add another uh, degree of freedom, let's say rotation. And that gives me a third parameter, which is the angle. Um, and now my space of parameter is three-dimensional. And I can keep adding this. If I really want a rich uh, augmentation scheme, then this is going to cover a, a wider range of transformation. And so I get a larger number of parameters. And that is progressively making it actually exponentially more difficult because the number of samples I need to cover that tra uh, transformation space grows exponentially in number of parameters, simply because the volume of that space is growing exponentially in number of parameters. So it doesn't scale if you have uh, richer transformations. And that is the motivation of this talk, because I want to propose a different way for doing data augmentation um, that doesn't use sampling, but instead using the notion of adversarial examples. Before seeing how, uh, let me first tell you, uh, for those who are not familiar, what is an adversarial example? Suppose I have this image of the cow on the left, and the classifier is trained on it, already can recognize this as a cow, but then I, cho I choose a very carefully designed uh, perturbation, add that to the image, and the magnitude of this perturbation can be very tiny to the point that it's not even uh, visible to the human eye. But it, it's so powerful because it can fool the classifier. So it may no longer see this as a cow, but see it as a different animal. And there is a way for designing this adversarial perturbation so that you know, they, they, they have this kind of you know, fooling property so they can fool the classifier. But uh, the thing I want to highlight here is uh, basically two things. First of all, it's motivating to think of adversarial examples as a way for you know, doing data augmentation, because in some sense, 
an adversarial image of this cow is in some sense the most difficult image uh, of cow for this classifier, right? So if I learn how to correctly recognize this most difficult example, then I should be able to, you know, do a decent job on this easier example, right? So other, other forms of, you know, uh, perturbations of this cow. So that's tempting because I can start thinking about maybe I don't need to sample the, the full space of, you know, perturbations of this cow, but I can only uh, learn the most difficult um, modified version of this cow. And if I learn that, then I should, you know, because that's the worst case or the most difficult, then I should automatically know how to uh, recognize the easier ones. So that's the good news. The bad news is that in practice, it actually doesn't work. So if you actually go and apply this the transform, this perturbation I show on the right to the image, you get this cow image that even can fool the classifier. You include that in your training, retrain with that. It learns, okay, it's no longer fooled by that uh, perturbed version of the cow, but now you go and deploy it uh, and apply some you know, new novel images of cows that were not in your training set. And you see that, uh, it doesn't make you know an improvement to use these adversarial examples in your training. It didn't learn much from these adversarial examples. Um, some people even report that sometimes it hurts uh, the generalization performance. I conjecture the reason that this happens is because this adversarial perturbation is very rich. So it's completely free. So that's why it can pick up this weird unstructured pattern uh, looks like random dots and random colors, and it, it the whole goal of you know adversarial procedure is to choose this pattern in a way that it can break the classifier. So it can go and find some blind spots in the classifier that you know are manifested in this kind of uh, unstructured pattern, because the sole goal is to break the classifier. But this kind of you know random pattern kind of perturbation don't happen in, in the real world, uh, at least when the scenario, uh, when you set up the system at the you know, deployment time, you are not dealing with adversarial. So it's just a standard setup where the only goal is to you know, expose it to new images of the cow and be able to have a good generalization there. Uh, it doesn't help there because you know, these transformations don't occur in, in real world. Um, Instead, in augmentation, as, as I emphasized earlier, we are including transformation that can happen in reality because we can see that the optic from different angles or I, I may move the camera a little bit toward the, uh, I don't know, in X, Y, or rotate it. So these are realistic transformations. Okay, so what is the proposal then? How we can fix this? So suppose instead of like using the uh, full complexity of this uh, adversarial space, I restrict myself to a smaller space. In our case, it will be a subspace actually. Such in this subspace, the transformations have to be structured. And then what I do is that once I compute this unstructured, pure adversarial noise-like perturbation, I project that onto this structured subspace and get this image at the bottom left. This is the structured adversarial perturbation. And it, as you can see, it maintains the figure and background shape. It, it you know, it adds the same, uh, it adds the same um, color value to, to the body of the cow and more or less the same to the grass. So it has, you know, this kind of structure and coherent uh, recolorization. So if I add this back to the image, I get the recolorized cow where um, the effect it has is, you know, it's not, it's visible. I mean, I, I magnify so that it's visible, uh, but you don't see a weird pattern. You just see that the grasses, you know, became a little bit more dry, and um, maybe the cow a little bit more faint, faint. But um, still, it's within you know realm of believable images. So you 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 don't find this very weird you know transformation, and it's relative to uh, the pure adversarial. So the goal is to, you know, build this kind of transformations, restricted perturbations, and uh, I'll show within this talk how you can do this. I'll give you two examples where you can uh, do this. 
So before moving further, because we want to now start the technical part, I need to introduce some notation. So as like any learning scheme, we have a loss function, L. It depends on three components. One is the parameters by which we parameterize the models. So showing uh, that uh, as W. Uh, we have the input image, which I show as Z. And we have the uh, true label, which I show as L. So loss is telling me uh, for the given model from, with the given parameters W and for the given image, how well I'm predicting this label, how it differs from the uh, ground, truth, ground truth label L. Um, and Z is the image. It's just a long vector where I'm essentially uh, concatenating pixel values at all coordinates of the image. One thing you may notice is that I'm also assuming the images are a function of t, which is time. So you can think of it as a video type of uh, thing. Um, and the reason will become clear, because later we want to differentiate this in time. We really don't care about you know, its evolution of uh, farther steps, but it's helpful to you know, have this um, time evolution perturbation. We will use that. Um, and throughout this talk, we really are not concerned about uh, the labels or the learned weights. The key is the input image and how we manipulate that to build these adversarial images. So for brevity, I'll drop the dependency of loss to W and L. So loss throughout this talk is essentially of form two. All right. Now, as I said, in the adversarial setting, so this is just formalizing what I showed in the figure, we are looking for a perturbation of the loss um, such that it can you know, increase the, the loss the most. So in order to uh, find this perturbation um, in time, I can simply use chain rule and write this uh, derivative of loss with respect to time as this dot product. So this dot product is essentially uh, showing the gradient of the loss with respect to input image dot product with z dot. z dot is the perturbation change. And um, our goal is to choose this z dot in a way that you know, it, it, it maximizes this quantity. All right, so if there is no restriction, we know that uh, z dot should be uh, aligned with the gradient, right? Because that when they, they are completely aligned, then up to you know a negative sign because mm, we want to maximize this. Um, sorry, actually the sign is okay. So we want to maximize. So uh, it's maximized when z dot is completely aligned with this gradient. So z dot will be parallel to this gradient, and that is exactly what people use in um, like standard adversarial setting. So they directly use the gradient as the perturbation, multiply with some strength coefficient, and add that to the image. But now we want to uh, constrain this zeta to some additional, you know, uh, to satisfy some addi additional structural properties. And that's how this is going to be different from standard adversarial pipeline. And uh, today I'll be discussing about two ways that we uh, impose this structure. One of them is uh, geometric uh, transformation. The other one is called uh, photometric transformation. And I'll discuss this in details uh, starting from geometric. So by geometric transform, I mean I have the image. I can move pixels around, but I cannot change their colors. This happens when you have a motion in an image, right? If you have a video or even two frames, and then this corresponds to slightly moving the camera, maybe zooming in a little bit, then each point is going to move to a new point in the next frame. But it's the same point from the same object. So the color doesn't change. Or in this case, it's a grayscale image. So the brightness doesn't change. This is called brightness constancy principle. We can actually just formalize this. All it's saying is that if my image is Z, each uh, particle in the image, like each, each uh, pixel, uh, can move in time. So it's now a function of time. That's why you see X and Y uh, are both a function of time. But the key is that the intensity value, which is the value of z, should not change in time. So the derivative of this with respect to t has to be 0. And then using chain rule, you can express that in this form. So this is now applying a spatial gradient uh, along x and y directions to the image, and then multiplies that with these velocity vectors. 
and then that has to be uh, plus z dot that has to be equal to zero this gives us a way to you know impose a structure on z dot now z dot can be solved easily by moving these guys to the other side of this equation and then plug it back into our uh, dot product which was the gradient times z dot we are just plugging inside and we get this form okay so uh, this is already you know giving a little bit of restriction on how this z dot can be chosen but it turns out it's not enough why because when you go to this um, actually sorry before that uh, i need to also simplify the notation a little bit it's nothing uh, complicated we are just trying to uh, make it more clear that l is sorry the derivative of l with respect to time is just a dot product of x dot y dot with some other quantities so what i'm doing here is that i'm just grouping everything else into these dx dy whose definition is here and this this way it's more clear to see that it's just a dot product of this velocity and some some other constants that only depend on the loss value and the image all right so now the goal is to optimize this um, but um, it turns out this is not enough structure uh, or enough constraint because first of all the function is unbounded if i want to minimize this quantity x dot and y dot are not constrained so it can go to minus infinity uh, because uh, there's no bound. So just to make as uh, get a sensible solution, we uh, we would like to you know uh, penalize the L2 norm of x dot y dot so that the solution stays bounded. And on top of that, I said that we are moving pixels, but we are not allowed to change the colors. Fine, but this is the too much freedom because you can scramble the image, right? And we don't want that to happen. We want these uh, vectors or the motion, the velocity field. The vectors the velocity field to be coherent so x dot for example have a small derivative in x and y direction likewise about y dot so that's why here we are penalizing those as well this is again just to impose some coherency on the motion field and now um, we have you know a, a nice problem uh, we can even make it more compact representation by introducing this p and um, you know just simplify the notation again nothing extraordinary is going on but this p has a nice interpretation now it's a laplace operator so we can formulate this in this form and now this is a uh, convex objective function uh, we can easily find its minimizer by zero crossing the gradient so if we compute the gradient in x dot and y dot and zero cross it this will be the, the form of the solution so this coefficient gamma is the thing that controls uh, the coherency or smoothness of the motion field so it's like a regularizer um, the thing that is important here to note about this is that uh, this matrix um, this inversion can be uh, computed offline right um, because p is only let me show it again so this p um, uh, is only uh, you know a function of these uh, 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 differential operators. It has nothing to do with the loss or the given image. So you can efficiently compute this offline, and um, uh, basically at runtime you just go and plug it in. So you don't need to do this expensive in matrix immersion at the runtime. Here's a illustrative but real example. Um, of how this works so we had a model a ResNet trained on ImageNet and it could already co correctly classify these images from ImageNet so this was um, this is a, a truck correctly recognize a truck with this confidence this is a red bone it's a breed of the dog correctly classified as red bone and with this confidence now we can apply the ideas that I said and then move the pixels around. The motion fields uh, are a little bit faint, but you might be able to see them. They're like yellowish arrows in these figures and slightly deform the object geometrically. Now, this is recognized as a minibus and this is called, uh, this is recognized as uh, another breed of the dog called Boxer. Um, I think it kind of also makes sense because uh, you know usually with the minibus because it has people uh, sitting so the this side of the bus needs to have more room so it, it's a little bit higher so it's actually stretching up this side and for this one um, 
the breed the boxer breed is a uh, type of dog that has some white spots on its body so if you look here you say it's taking part of this cloth to be look like a part of the body because um if you, if you look carefully here you will see that here a significant part of the leg is brown but now it's kind of like uh, blended into the dog so that you know the brownish area is kind of thinner and you see more white that looks like to be on the body of the dog. So, I mean, it's not like very confusing, but it's, I think, moving in the right direction. So this way we are generating this controlled geometric transform. Uh, we can do a similar thing for uh, something that I call photometric transform. And here by photometric, we mean the opposite of geometric. So in geometric, remember, uh, we could move the pixels around, but we were not allowed to change the color or brightness. Here's the opposite. So we are not allowed to move the pixels around, but we can recolorize the image. So that means if I have an image that is you know, comprised of a bunch of regions, uh, homogeneous regions, each region can change its color. By homogeneous, I mean it has more or less the same color. Each region can change its color, but uh, you don't want the regions to, you know, uh, still the region should still have this like the single color so it can for example turn from blue to red but you cannot say okay i want to make this part of image red this part green and so as long as they're within the same you know uh, homogeneous region they have to uh, recolorize with the same color um, and this allows, you know, to, if you have an object that can appear in different colors, you know, this is, this can help with generating the same, uh, the same, uh, you know, uh, image, like with the same contour, just the colors change. All right. So in order to see how we can use this, we first need some notion uh, of edgeness or edge strength, because that helps us to identify where are the boundaries in the image. Uh, by the way, this is just as uh, this is very this is just a suggestion on how to identify these boundaries just to communicate the concept. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the way the best way to you know uh, do the recolorization, but just uh, simple enough to explain the idea. So here uh, we define this notion of um, edge strength by taking the spatial derivative of the image in x and y directions, squaring that, adding up, a, b, c show the color channels. We just repeat that for all color channels. This thing is the overall edge uh, strength. And then the goal is to use this edginess, look into the image and see the regions that are homogeneous so that they have very small uh, like uh, edge strength in them. At pixels that you have very small edge strength. Uh, you are not allowed to make any change to to the level of edginess. So if um, if somewhere already had a low edge, it has to remain low edge, and vice versa. So this is saying that the contours or edges will remain the same, uh, but that's the only constraint that we have, because it doesn't put any constraint about the colors, right? So the colors can be still be chosen adversarially. So I can uh, define this through a penalty. Uh, PT here, which is basically penalizing the uh, changes in the edge strength, but then weights that by the inverse of the current edge I, I see at that location. So if I have a place that a, a, a pixel that belongs to a homogeneous region, this would be a small, and so I get a very huge penalty if I uh, if I want to change that to something that has a uh, larger edge, which again implies that within that region, I have to stay uh, with the same color, but the color has to be fixed. So um, here I'm just again using chain rule and um, dropping, you know, some of the unnecessary uh, uh, details of the notation. At the end, the P can be written in this form. And uh, also, this is written in continuous representation, but in practice, you know, the images we have them as discrete. So uh, simply what you do is replace this integration with sum and everything converts to uh, matrices instead of functions. So essentially, uh, P can be written as this norm where uh, it depends on these 
matrix and this vector n is the resolution of the image and alpha is the placeholder for any channel abc so for each channel uh, i just replace alpha with the corresponding abc so if i go back to my optimization so i'm trying to minimize this thing z dot times the gradient but also add this penalty then Again, this is an easy optimization with closed form. I can obtain the closed form. Uh, at the end, it will have this uh, form. So Z dot will be the gradient. Sorry about this uh, yellow spot. It's just the, the gradient um, of the loss with respect to image. Um, this vector times a matrix, and this matrix is, uh, you know, basically, um, uh, the result of, um, okay, it's important to say that uh, this, uh, this matrix depends on the image, but it doesn't depend on the loss or model. So uh, maybe I revisit the definition of M. Okay, so as you can see, it depends on Z. Z is the image, so it depends on uh, the gradients of the image. It also has some differential operators on top of it, but it doesn't use any information about the loss, which means it doesn't know anything about the loss or the model. So this is good because it, it means that uh, even though this M, M uh, inverse matrix can be huge uh, and expensive to compute, uh, you only need to compute it once for an image, and then uh, you can go and you know play with whatever model deep or not deep um, different architectures. Uh, this M will uh, this M inverse will not change. Um, so that is partially good, but still it's challenging to compute it. It's expensive because um, even if you store this matrix, just due to the fact that it's a huge matrix, computing this multiplication will be slow, right? So. Uh, one thing you can do is to basically maintain a low rank approximation to M inverse. Uh, so you run SVD and just save on disk um, the dominant uh, singular vectors. And then at the runtime where you are playing with different architecture, you just load uh, this low rank approximation to uh, M inverse. So that essentially means that we are um, projecting. L okay. So if I use a few. Um, a few, uh, let's say, uh, singular vectors of this matrix M. That essentially means that I'm projecting this vector onto the subspace that is spanned by those uh, uh, singular vectors. And um, those are the ones, you know, that maintain most of the, uh, most of the important uh, structure about uh, uh, photometric transform because you know the, the, as we go uh, toward smaller and smaller uh, singular values the contribution to that dot product becomes smaller and smaller so here is again an illustrative example but it's uh, like based on real image real networks so we have these images original images from stl dataset and uh, we recolorize them these are the uh, dominant eigenvectors. They, they are good because they visually say what is, you know, uh, this thing is being projected onto, right? So essentially we're computing the dot product of this with uh, this uh, image. And um, as you can see, this is already maintaining a lot of the spatial structure of the image. So it doesn't, it takes this wide adversarial unstructured perturbation because it's you know uh, projecting to the space of structured bases, the resulted image will be structured. So uh, we don't see. So basically, what's happening is that you compute the dot product of this with this, and again um, uh, multiply that coefficient with the basis, and that's how you you do it for each basis and reconstruct the image, and you get this image. So here you can see that the images are colorized. Here you get a bluebird. Here, okay, here is interesting. Uh, there's something I want to emphasize because the way this recolorization may look like at the first glance is maybe you could do the same thing by, you know, by uh, changing the hue, for example, or saturation. Some of these parameters uh, related co uh, to color 
but those will change everything globally. So if I change the hue as a, as a, as a way to you know, create another image with slightly different color, it's going to replace everywhere that I see this color with a new color because I'm shifting the hue, for example. But this, we are doing more than that when we use this uh, formulation. It's choosing specific locations. So here it somehow identifies you know, this top region belonging to the head uh, to be different than, than the rest. And it only applies this recolorization um, to where the, you, know, you have the, the most yellow, the most strength in the basis. So it allows you to take a specific part of the object or animal and then recolorize that, even though you know, the, the full uh, entity of that animal could still have the same color. But you can break it up this way. You cannot do that by simply shifting the hue. All right, so at the end, uh, I want to say if you go and evaluate this idea, whether it buys you anything uh, in practice. So we see some boost when we use this approach for data augmentation. Here, um, we are using ResNet32 model on different data sets, C410, C4100, and STL. So here is the basic uh, augmentation techniques um, that people use. Actually, this is plain augmentation. These are more advanced uh, augmentations. Um, but still, we can go beyond these uh, if you uh, look at the numbers. So here, what we are doing is we are combining this uh, basic augmentation based on augmentations with the uh, proposed scheme using structured adversarial perturbation. So recolorization and flow refers to the, um, the geometric transform that we saw. So here in this slide, we can see that recolorization actually gives us the biggest boost, even bigger than geometric, and it goes beyond all these benchmarks, uh, baselines. So the performance uh, boosts consistently across all these data sets when we go to, when we combine our augmentation with standard augmentation. Um, so this is when we train the model from scratch. We also thought about fine tuning, like, okay, you have a model trained on ImageNet and now we want to adapt it to, for example, learn C4 images. Uh, instead of starting from scratch, you just start from the model that had learned the weights for ImageNet, and that's your start point. And from the, that point on, you just uh, tune the weights to uh, you know, get a good um, training error on the new data set, let's say C4. So that's called fine tuning. So here we use efficient nets uh, for that. And Again, comparing against uh, augmentation schemes, we see that um, the adversarial augmentation can give a, uh, a boost on top of all these baseline across all data sets. Interestingly here, the geometric is giving us the biggest boost, but um, in practice, you, know, you, can, you can perhaps use the combination or even think about other transformation uh, uh, that may still, you know, be used within this framework that I mentioned today. Actually, that is one of the directions that I want to suggest for uh, future work is to uh, use these examples, uh, which I showed recolorization and uh, geometric transform. Um, they have a lot in common. Uh, they were all you know, using simple differential operators on images in order to uh, put some constraint on the way that ZDOT is computed. And maybe you can use the same framework to uh, come up with other transformations uh, other than these two that I gave an ex as an example. And even more generally, you might be able to learn uh, this operator from the data itself. Because currently we are engineering this, for example, recolorization or the um, uh, geometric transform um, but if we have a large data set, maybe the data set itself reveals what sorts of what sorts of transformations are you know happening in that data set, and maybe we can have an operator um, that is learned from that data, um, and then once that is learned, that operator can be used for another data set, uh, applied to another data set to generate augmentations uh, based on you know 
the first data set that we saw. Basically, the first data set is showing what are the interesting variations happening in the image. If that can be picked up, then we can use that operator um, and basically to compute the z dot and uh, use it in this adversarial setting. Um, so with this, I uh, conclude my talk. Thank you again for uh, joining and for listening to this.